This is an IBM PC XT. It's manufactured, of course, by IBM, and it sells for about $4,000. These are IBM clones, or lookalikes, or theoretically compatibles. They generally cost less than an IBM, and they claim to run IBM software. But will they or won't they? We'll find out next as we take a look at the IBM clones on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, the subject today is the IBM clones. And the question I get asked more than anything else by people who are about to buy computers is, should I buy an IBM or should I buy one of the IBM lookalikes? Well, the answer, of course, depends a lot on this issue of compatibility. Now, the question I have for you, so I can answer all those other questions, is what do we mean when we say compatible? Well, in the case of hardware and software, compatible means, of course, it does the same thing or more. Uh, and that's both good and bad. Uh, in the case of the personal computers, uh, over 10 years ago, IBM set a standard 8-inch floppy disk that was the format that everybody used for distributing software. Really basically set the industry uh, going in many ways. Now today we have a very complex uh, situation where we're trying to emulate both hardware and software that grows and becomes more and more complex. And so we have a whole industry that sort of chases the changes that IBM makes. Uh, direct answer to your question, uh, compatibility to a user means it runs the programs that you want to run. Okay, we're going to take a careful look at some of the IBM lookalikes. We'll have several experts here. We'll meet the publisher of PC World. Now, how hard is it to make an IBM clone? Well, you'll be surprised to find out it could almost be a do-it-yourself job. We have a report. Most computer users are familiar with a profusion of IBM lookalikes that promise to do more for less money. But few PC owners are aware of the alternate route to PC ownership, building it yourself from scratch. Despite the IBM logo prominently displayed on every PC case, very few parts come directly from IBM. In fact, over 95% of the PC is produced outside of IBM. Apart from the motherboard, the case, and the power supply, components come from such diverse sources as Hitachi and Texas Instruments. But why build your own PC? Well, in becoming intimate with your machine, you'll learn about hardware functions and compatibility, and you may understand the machine's potential better than most users. But best of all, you can save about $1,000 by doing it yourself. Parts are cheap and can be picked up at the local electronics store. There are manuals on everything from dip switches to semiconductors, and the typical user will probably spend a good deal of time reading before he does any building. Getting to know your PC's ICs has other advantages. If you don't like some of the hardware, you can make your own improvements, like installing a faster chip or a better disk drive for less money. The open architecture design of the machine makes that possible. Should you build your own clone? It depends on whether you can trade time for money. This PC project took about two weeks to complete, not including about 100 hours of research. But for a user willing to do some reading and some shopping, the advantages are undeniable. Okay, with us now is Ed Juge, Director of Market Planning for Tandy Radio Shack, and David Bennell, publisher of PC World Magazine, Macworld, and a couple other things. Gary? Ed, the uh, first question I have is uh, IBM has set up a situation here uh, much like the mainframe industry where they've set standards and then other people follow along right behind them. Uh, one of the things that in the last couple of years they've done is a very good job of taking a, a significant piece of the personal computer market. Now, if IBM sets the standards, uh, then why would anyone buy other than IBM? Well, IBM has certainly set some standards to which a lot of software companies have written. The reason that we feel that we'll do well with the Tandy 1000, for example, which is our primary compatible, is that uh, it offers a price performance advantage that you don't have with IBM. It 
is compatible with the PC, but includes some graphics and sound enhancements that are normally available only on the PC Junior. Mm -hmm. Ed, now I've seen, I think, the thousand advertised as the, mm -hmm. quote, mirror image of an IBM PC. Uh, does that bother you in any way as another computer company? Is that the goal, to be the mirror image of a no, PC? No, the one you're thinking about is the 1200, which is a mirror image of the PC XT. Uh -huh. This is not a mirror image of the PC as such. But, I mean, the general notion, I mean, it, it, what does that do to the industry if the object is to simply advertise everything as being exactly like an IBM? Well, we don't, we don't advertise this product being exactly like the IBM. We advertise it as having some enhancements over the IBM. What we're trying to do is to leverage off the popularity of that operating system and all of the software that's out there available for it. We're not trying to do everything that IBM does. So what you basically say is, that, well, the IBM PC is, a, is the base level. Now what we'll do is we'll enhance that right. by... We'll try to say, bring something right. else to the party. So, for example, something like a compact would offer, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, portability, where yeah. one of their, let's say, the XT would not or something right. like that. David, uh, from your perspective, is this good or bad for the industry, this, this obsession with IBM compatibility? Uh, well, I, I wanted to make a point first, which is that a truly successful compatible machine usually offers something different than a PC. It's not a mirror image. The machines that have been mirror images have not been successful, so the compact has been successful. There's a lot of excitement about the Tandy 1000. Uh, the Data General 1, which is a briefcase portable, has uh, created a lot of interest. So I think a uh, compatible computer has to be offer something special. But the important thing is to be able to run the same software base. Now, the question you raise is uh, one that's being debated uh, a lot in the industry because if you have one standard and everyone adheres to it, it tends, it tends to inhibit uh, creativity and innovation. And so I think that's true, that uh, there is a, an element of that. Well, uh, David, what, what, what do you think would be the biggest threat uh, to IBM's position in this situation? Are the, can the clones actually uh, take any significant market share? Or are they doing that now? Well, I don't think that anything is really a threat to the IBM <laughs> position, and I don't anticipate right. that they will begin to decline. But personal computers are used for so many different tasks that there can be many different kinds of personal computers. And people have different needs for different types of systems, and IBM can't make them all. One, one uh, I guess, uh, uh, view you could take of this is that, is that if uh, a clone uh, that is actually offering more like portability, for mm -hmm. example, uh, becomes successful, a successful notion like that, then isn't it the case that IBM would or even has gone in there and taken that market to some extent? It, that's the danger of uh, playing the IBM compatible game because they have great uh, efficiency in manufacturing and they can come in and lower the price at any moment and uh, that's probably why some of the compatible companies such as uh, Columbia Data and Eagle have had come on uh, hard times. Mm -hmm. Ed, I want to ask you about the Tandy 1000. As David mentioned, it is getting a lot of good press as an IBM compatible. Uh, but it comes bundled with DeskMate, its own software. And if one of the selling points is it's compatible and runs the IBM software, then why does it come with its own software? Uh, let me make one point that I think I missed a minute ago that uh, it might be interesting. Tandy builds several families of computers. The IBM compatibles or the MS-DOS machines are just one family. We also build a multi-user system which uses Enix and right. we have our own 8-bit. The reason we brought out DeskMate, which is really uh, it's a combination of about six different applications. You have a little simple text processor, there's a worksheet, there's a little database manager, telecommunications, uh, calendar function, which is kind of a running to-do list, and an electronic mail system, was, of course, to bring out a package that, number one, would give the user something that he could use immediately when he takes it home that might just be all the software he ever needs, uh, if he has simple needs. Number two is, frankly, it's an easy way for our people in the store to learn how to demonstrate the product mm -hmm. because DeskMate will be available on all of our product lines. Uh, it's nice to have something like that that you can bundle with the package that gives it some additional value. Okay, David, I want to ask you, and maybe uh, I want to get to the question of some of the standard tests, Ed, for compatibility. Mm -hmm. And we hear about Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Flight Simulator as some of those tests. Uh, I know you've got Flight Simulator oh, there. Maybe you can try to load it. Right. And, and meanwhile, David, uh, why are these considered uh, sort of benchmark tests of compatibility? What do they, they test? Uh, well, Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Flight Simulator 
a call on the BIOS, which is separate from the operating system. It's uh, code that's on the ROM chip. And so a, a real compatible computer has to emulate that code without copying it. And uh, that's become the uh, test for compatibility. It's also interesting if you take a look at uh, something like a, a major change in the, in the operating system interface, like TopView that mm -hmm. IBM has introduced. Uh, what does that do for the compatibles? Uh, they have a whole new now level of software to, to implement in a compatible but uh, right. in, without copying. <laughs> that, I think that's, you, that's one of the major problems is the, the IBM standard, so-called standard, is a moving target. <laughs> and it keeps changing, so people have to keep scrambling to update to the latest mm -hmm. uh, uh, level. So, Do you think it's possible to actually have 100% compatibility with the complexity of the systems that we have now? Well, we find that... Uh, uh, the Compaq uh, computer nearly achieves 100% compatibility, and recently we found a uh, new uh, televideo computer, we found that 70 top packages ran on it, and the uh, Data General 1, which uh, uses a smaller diskettes, we found that uh, most of the leading software companies have uh, transferred their programs mm -hmm. to the smaller diskettes, and the Tandy 1000 has a high level of compatibility. So. Usually, if you can run most of the major packages, that's compatible enough. Well, lo and behold, uh, Flight Simulator seems to be uh, coming, yeah. coming up on the Tandy 1000. Now, one last question, David. In terms of IBM, and as you mentioned before, nobody's really going to threaten them. We hear much about what they really think about this whole clone business. What, what do you think is the IBM strategy, or do they really care? Uh, well, I think the IBM strategy has been to have an open system to encourage the development of a lot of software for their computers. But as they uh, increase the amount of machines they manufacture and the efficiency of their distribution system, they lower their prices and they try to take bigger pieces of the action. And uh, it would be foolish to think that they're not highly competitive and that they don't want to dominate the market, because they do. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. In just a minute, we'll take a look at one of the most successful of the IBM clones, and we'll talk to a lawyer about how legal or illegal it is to make one. That's coming up next. Okay, now joining us is Woody Liswood, a consultant, an author, and one of the editors of the Whole Earth Software Catalog, and David Grace. David is an attorney with the firm of Grace & Richards, and David specializes in computer law. Now, before we get to uh, Woody and David, you know, the problems of compatibility do not only occur with the clones, there are often problems of compatibility within the IBM line. And Wendy Woods takes a look at that problem. IBM says the new improved PC Junior will run over a thousand programs for the PC. Well, obviously we can't try all of them out, but we do have a randomly selected sample that we're going to test right now. The programs chosen for the test on a 384K PC Junior, assisted by a legacy upgrade, were Continental's home accountant, Fontrix, Condor Software Evaluation Series, Spock Chess Master by Cypress, Diskette Manager by Lassen, Prince Star, Bellsoft's Telcom, and Sidekick by Borland. Half of these programs worked, and half of them didn't. Well, first thing is any graphics display. Uh, Spock, the chess master, for instance, crashed right in the middle of the opening graphics display and would not go further. Another one is anything to do with copy protection. We had the Sidekick program, a copy protected and non-copy protected version. The non-copy protected version ran perfectly. The copy protected one did not, and they were both rated for the PC Junior. Another one is problems involving timing. Any kind of a clock can mess things up. And the fourth is most insidious, and that is simply where the computer software manufacturer decides to put his program in RAM. There's not a single thing you, way you can detect that or guard against it. And a word to the wise. Make sure you see the program run on a PC Junior before you buy it from the store. Even more important, make sure you can get a refund. Reporting for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Now, Stuart, if uh, compatibility within, I in, within IBM is an issue, then it's certainly got to be a lot more difficult for a clone to achieve compatibility. Big problem. Woody brought with him a compact, which is claimed to be 99% compatible with the IBM line. I guess 99% doesn't mean that you get 99 out of 100 programs, but it, there's, there's no real guarantee that a program will run. Uh, can you show us what will happen when a program doesn't run on a compatible? 
Okay, I brought a, a program called uh, Scientific Plotter with me, which is one of the, the very few that I found that doesn't run on mm -hmm. the Compact. And let's take a look. Uh, this program is very popular in the Apple world and is one that we recommended in the catalog. It is a good buy and, and does some good stuff. As you can see, it comes up nicely. And we'll get our opening screen. And right now, the computer's jammed. No matter what you type, nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. well, and this is a go back to powering the machine down and, and restarting the computer system right. again. Does, a, uh, does a, uh, a user have any recourse at this point? Uh, no, what I did is when I ran into the problem, I called uh, Interactive Microware, which publishes it, and said, hey, I really appreciate you sending us the program, but uh, it's not running on my Compact, and it does run on my XT. And uh, the lady I talked to says, well, we were told to tell anybody who called that says it will not run with any of the software basics that have to be loaded, that they wrote the program mm -hmm. using the ROM-based IBM basic, and if you don't have exactly that, it just will not run. Okay. I'm going to turn this off here. Okay. Yeah, maybe we'll turn it on later. We want to show another example here in a okay. minute. Woody. David, I, I want to ask you a question. Uh, it seems to me there's some legal question here, obviously, and there have been lawsuits involved in this whole issue of stealing uh, IBM BIOS and ROM and so on. Uh, how can you legally uh, make an IBM clone and advertise it as exactly like an IBM? Well, you can legally make it as long as you can persuade a judge that you haven't gone to computer land and bought a copy of the IBM program for their BIOS and copied it. So the way you have to do that is have one person prepare a specification of what the program's supposed to do and have another person who's never seen the IBM program write a program to do it. And if you can persuade the judge that the second fellow didn't copy from the IBM code, then I think you'll be pretty safe. Okay, but there, there were a couple of suits in which uh Eagle and others were sued That's for having done that. What, 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 why did they get sued? Well, we don't really know because they got sued and surrendered on the same day, so there wasn't much <laughs> chance to uh, find out what the merits of the case were, but you can pretty much figure that IBM had called them up on the phone before they filed their lawsuit, and those companies must have figured that they didn't have too strong a case or they probably would have put up a fight, I think. Now, there's an interesting issue that's come up recently with the, the Mac, for example, that may be a similar situation in the PC world, and that's where, where Apple has, a, has a, received a patent on the uh, process to go through the pull-down menu. Mm -hmm. Now, if patents like that are being uh, approved, it, it may be the case that something like Top View, for example, the way the Top View interacts with a user may be patentable. Uh, seems. Now, it, w wouldn't that cause some real, real problems? Well, Gary, I know that IBM intends to seek patent protection for Top View, but the law of patents with respect to software is so unsettled that it's really very difficult to say what the outcome is going to be, mm -hmm. whereas the law with respect to copyright, because of uh, another Apple suit uh, against Franklin, has really achieved a much higher level of clarity. So in, in the patent world, uh, the odds are much more open than they are in the copyright world. I guess the real question uh, that I would have is, uh, uh, basically, if, if the whole clone industry is moves in a certain direction following IBM, and then there's a, there's a statement by IBM that we will now protect our uh, user interface under copyrights or patents or whatever, what would that do to the whole clone industry? I think it's too difficult to say without looking at the particular program and the way in which mm -hmm. it's protected. IBM took that position with respect to the PC BIOS, but I think that the PC BIOS has been successfully emulated in a legal way, and it's really pretty much a dead issue. Mm -hmm. That Tandy machine, for example, that Ed was showing in the previous segment, uh, has a perfectly legal, 100% uh, compatible BIOS in it. Uh, and so far as we know, IBM hasn't made any complaints about it, nor have they about, about the compact. But the next challenge is going to be to emulate the BIOS in the AT and then the top view interface, again, in, in a legal fashion, so that we don't have any more eagles and coronas. Now, what is the, we have so many, I, I think I'm told there's about 50 IBM clones out there on the market now, and some of them are, have died and are dying, and a couple like the Compaq and others are very successful. What's the difference, do you think, between a, a clone that makes it and a clone that fails? Well, I think that's more a commercial question than a legal one. Obviously, if you have a copied BIOS, you're going to fail because IBM will pursue you in court. But once you're legal, then it's a question of whether you're a better computer, and that's not a legal question so much as it is a, a commercial one. Well, what do you have from a user's point of view? Um, I looked at, at many of them before I decided on, on buying the Compact, and I bought the Compact because its reputation had been around, it had a larger installed base, and I could carry it. Uh, some of the other uh, transportable clones, uh, even at 38 pounds, this is movable. Others of them were too big. 
Um, other things uh, was more aesthetics, uh, perhaps marketing, perhaps other, other intangibles, but it had the reputation of being the most compatible of the compatibles. Mm -hmm. I used to take a software product called GraphWriter with me to test the uh, clones. It was a Pascal-based program, and the Compact was the only one that would run it. And that used to be the program I would use to test compatibility. And uh, I figured that with the next T at work and with me buying one for home and, and my personal use, I had to be compatible between the two. And, and that seems to be the issue. One of the things I think that's, uh, that's actually will help the, let's say, the clone industry would be, will be is IBM's attempt to, to generalize a little bit from the uh, specific hardware that they're producing now. For example, the VDI, which uh, insulates uh, application programs from uh, the graphics. Uh, previously, when we talked about working with, a, with an IBM machine, you had to have graphics that worked in a specific area. Now with a VDI, that gives you the independence to move to higher resolution and so forth, too. Mm -hmm. Woody, I think we have one other example. Maybe, Gary, if you could fire up the compact again of, of a different kind of compatibility problem right. uh, with regard to Sidekick. Maybe while it's warming up, you can explain what that problem is. Yeah, what we're looking at is, is I get a lot of programs in because of the magazine, and there's a lot of uh, windowing programs or what we call underlay programs that exist before you run your main application. Uh, Sidekick happens to be the most popular. As the uh, Compact boots, you'll see Sidekick come up on the screen and load in, and then you'll see another program called Wonder, 1DIR, which is a, a directory manager for the hard disk. They both work relatively well together. However, they get in the way of other programs when they want to run. Mm -hmm. uh, i give you an example of one which we can't see, and then show you an example of one which we can. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Because when we get into something like Top View again, where you're talking about multitasking and networking, yeah, absolutely. these programs are all designed to run on single user, you know, simple systems where they took over the whole computer. And now when you get in there in a situation where one program is running in a multitasking world with another, and they, st they start to access the screen at the same time, then the whole, the whole issue becomes more difficult. Could you yeah. take us through it right now? We have yeah, just a little bit of time. Sidekick has just come up. Uh, Wonder has just come up. Uh, Sidekick for example, we'll, uh, I'm going to uh, run SuperCalc 3. And I want you to watch the screen. SuperCalc 3 is an unprotected program, very good on uh, graphics. Did you see the message? With Sidekick in there, it is not able to find itself, and it gives me an error message that says, I don't know where I am. Would you please yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me where, where I am? So this is program incompatibility, not, yeah. not incompatibility. Yeah, I call it kind of software incompatibility, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. but, but everybody's trying to use the same memory at the same time and just uh, louses it up for, for everybody. And to be fair, you have the same problem when you try to run this on your IBM XT. Yeah, this, is, this is not a hardware compatibility <laughs> right. problem. It, it's, right. uh, it happened to me on both. Okay, well, we're out of time for this part of the program, gentlemen. Thank you. Now, the reason we're talking about IBM clones on this whole show is because of the power of IBM and almost a mythology around the power of Big Blue. Well, commentator Paul Schindler has some thoughts on that. Oh, excuse me, I was just completing my morning devotional. I realize my rendition of the IBM corporate logo is rather poor, but my plaster of Paris busts of IBM chairman John Opel and IBM PC guru Phil Estridge are in the shop being repaired. Actually, I think the idea of worshipping IBM would be kind of amusing. After all, the PC clone makers have been doing it for years. Frankly, I don't like it. I think personal computing is just another market that IBM has set the standard for, not because it had a superior product, but simply because it was IBM. I admit the PC market was in turmoil and ferment before IBM entered it, and that was rough on users. But that turmoil had an advantage. There were a lot of people trying to give everybody more computer for less money. IBM just waited and watched while a lot of other companies, notably Apple Computer, defined the personal computing market. Then IBM came in and used its traditional relationship with DP people to suggest to them they should buy IBM and nothing else. The result? With the exception of Apple Computer, all of the non-clone PC makers are dying on the vine. I don't own a clone. I don't even own an IBM PC. And I don't think I ever will because I want to encourage innovation, and I think you should too. In fact, we should all root for the non-clone PC makers to be successful. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, AT&T has announced a new, quote, expanded relationship with Microsoft. 
What that apparently means is a new push by AT&T to establish its Unix operating system as a new industry standard. At the annual Unix show in Dallas, AT&T said that it is working with Microsoft to assure that Microsoft's Xenix version of Unix is compatible with AT&T's System 5 Unix. AT&T also announced that Intel, National Semi, and Motorola have agreed to adapt their new microprocessors to work with the Unix System 5. The big Unix show was held at the country's first permanent computer expo in Dallas. It's called Infomart, and it opened last week. It cost nearly $100 million and has 1.5 million square feet of floor space. In the What Have You Done For Me Lately category, Xerox has announced that it will unload the Shugart disk drive company, which it bought seven years ago. Shugart pioneered the five and a quarter inch floppy disk. The stakes are getting higher in the software piracy battle. Forget the young hackers, MicroPro has just sued giant American Brands Incorporated, claiming that it illegally copied WordStar and other MicroPro programs. A just completed study by the Commerce Department says the United States software industry now has 70% of the world's software market, currently estimated at $18 billion. The study says that with proper copyright protection and trade policies, the U.S. software industry can soon grab 75% of the world market, which is estimated to be worth $55 billion in just two years. Speaking of software, here's Paul Schindler's pick for the week. If you think I'm bad on this thing, you ought to hear me on the piano. I'm one of those people of whom it can honestly be said that they can't carry a tune in the bucket. Besides that, though, I still like Toonsmith PC. Now, I've seen a few music-making programs in my days, but this one really takes the cake. The important difference between Toonsmith and the other music-making programs represents a fundamental dichotomy in the computer business. Do you teach music to programmers, or do you teach programming to musicians? Now, I don't know if John Brink, the author of Toonsmith PC, is a musician or not, but if he isn't, he should be. Well, let's have a look at the program. It includes a tutorial section to teach you how to use it, and to start you off, there's a skeleton with the basic instructions needed to begin writing a piece of music yourself. The music, by the way, consists of simple, basic language programs interpreted by Toonsmith. Finally, there are the demonstrations you've been listening to. What makes Toonsmith impressive is the fact that the IBM PC was never meant to make music. It has only one voice. That is, it can sound only one note at a time. And yet, by playing the notes so quickly, it simulates chords. It fooled you, didn't it? It fooled me. Toonsmith is one heck of a music-making program. $50 from Blackhawk Data in Chicago, Illinois. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. Bubble memories may be making a comeback. The much-heralded bubble memory devices of a few years ago faded when problems of cost and speed got in the way. But researchers at Carnegie Mellon Labs in Pittsburgh say they have come up with a new bubble memory that is 16 times more efficient than earlier versions. There's a new computer device being tested in New Jersey that can do an instant brain scan and determine whether or not the subject is under the influence of drugs. It's being tested by police as a possible supplement to breathalyzer tests for drunk or drugged drivers. Apple has unveiled its new Macintosh office. The new products include the $7,000 laser printer, which is IBM compatible, and the Apple Talk personal network, which will link up Macs and MS-DOS machines at a very low cost. The much-touted and promoted Apple Super Bowl commercial hit with about the force of the Miami offense. Great hype, but generally considered to be a letdown after the stunning 1984 commercial of last year. There was a mystery in Fayetteville, North Carolina last week. The phone company recorded hundreds of phone calls being made in the middle of the night from a building which was totally unoccupied. How come? Turns out the Coke machines in the building are programmed to automatically call a computer at the local distributor when the machines are empty. Two machines started calling at precisely the same time, and each got a busy signal, and so kept calling again all night long. The Coke bottler says the system has been taken down for debugging. Finally, a company in Cambridge has developed a new software program called Puppy Love. It is a computer pet, the depiction of a dog with some artificial intelligence. It can respond, do tricks, and its designer says, eventually crossbreed with other compu pups. I want to see that one. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Popular Computing, the authoritative microcomputer magazine from McGraw-Hill.